But uh, Psalm 112, uh, just reading all ten verses, Praise the Lord, how blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light arises in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious and compassionate and righteous. It is well with the man who is gracious and lends. He will maintain his cause in judgment, for he will never be shaken. The righteous will be remembered forever. He will not fear evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is upheld. He will not fear until he looks with satisfaction on his adversaries. He is given freely to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted in honor. The wicked will see it and be vexed. He will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked will perish. Now really, just kind of in a, in a broad theme, this particular psalm walks us into the steadiness of trusting in God. Most of us tend to trust other things at a what we would call a heart level right? Um, you have people who say, well, I'm led by my heart or what have you. And so they're, uh, they're led by other things on a heart level, bank accounts, you know, uh, reputation, family, uh, intellectual uh, ability, physical strength, or maybe they're resting their hopes uh, on the future, something that they don't currently have, but something that uh, might come into their possession in some way in the future. But we often draw, while we often draw strength from these, what can be good earthly gifts, uh, we can also do so in a way, draw strength in an unhealthy way, uh, because it relies on something that can be taken away at any moment. I mean, you think about it, someone can steal your identity and drain your bank accounts, or they can call you on the phone and pretend to be the IRS or Social Security Administration, and next thing you know, you're handing over your banking information and all your finances are, are gone. Uh, someone can lie or start a rumor about you and ruin your reputation. A uh, family member or friend, they can become woefully sick with a, a terminal illness. Uh, you could suffer uh, dis debilitating disease. Even our future's not certain. You think of James and he says, what is your life but a vapor? It's here one moment and, and gone the next. So sometimes we have this idea of resting our laurels or resting on our laurels and putting our confidences in these earthly things, right? Uh, again, there's nothing necessarily wrong uh, with, you know, having some confidence in, you know, okay, so I've got enough money in my bank account, paying bills, that's not a problem. If I want to go out to eat, that's not a problem. Uh, but it's when things start to take place, the place of God, and we start to rest our hopes on, on those things. Those who walk with God, on the other hand, are funneling their hopes squarely onto God himself. You might think of Psalm 112, uh, you know, 112, the latter portion there of verse 7. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Now, this, the why is because he's not going to fear evil tidings. That's the beginning there of verse 7. He's not going to fear and the evilness of men or the wickedness of the world because he has this steadfast trust in God. Trusting in God allows him not to be afraid of anything else or anything that could be removed. Uh, you know, you think of Job, we all, we've, you know, the patience of Job, the trials of Job, and, and land, and animals, and family, and houses, and property, they're all, you know, they're all taken away. And what was Job's response? Now, his wife's response was, why do you hold on to your integrity? Why don't you just curse God and die? And so it's kind of interesting, her just saying, holding on to your integrity, curse God and die. One, because she knows that death would follow someone who cursed God, and yet she encouraged her husband to do it. I almost think of Eve being like, hey, want some fruit? You know? I mean, I know we're vegetarians right now, but you want some fruit? 
But she says that even among everything is that his integrity was still found in God. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So this particular individual or the one that he's speaking of here in Psalm 112 doesn't have a fear of evil things because he has his hope in God. and Because even the worst news possible, the worst event possible in his life uh, can only threaten his earthly cares, his, his property, his, his clothing, even, even his own life. But nothing can take away God himself. You think of Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. There, Paul writing, he says, I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present so not, not e I'm convinced that not even things happening in my current circumstances. And then he follows that with nor things to come. So uh, I'm convinced that there is nothing happening to me now and there's nothing that will happen or could happen to me in the future. Nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's nothing that can separate us from God. Now, the Calvinist will look at that particular verse and say, you see right there, Paul says that, you know, God cannot be removed from you. And I would like to clarify what Paul is saying here is that absolutely right. There is no outside force that can remove us from God. However... We can remove ourselves by continuing to live in a sinful lifestyle, by not repenting, by not focusing on the things of God, those things where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, Colossians 3, verses 1 through 3. So it's not a matter of we can't lose our salvation because we can. It's a matter of keeping God first. And ultimately, this, uh, this individual in Psalm 112 uh, this life for him, this trusting in God is, is like a breaking of the dawn. You look at the beginning of verse 4, light arises in the darkness for the upright. What does that mean, though? Well, for those who trust in the Lord, those who take all of their anxieties, and I mean all of them. You know, it's kind of interesting. I've noticed this even sometimes in my own prayer life of holding things back, you know? Like, uh, I'll sit there and I'll pray over or for certain anxieties, stresses, worries, and what have you. But for whatever reason, there are some that I want to keep to myself. I, I don't know why that is. Maybe that's been you sometimes. You know, that you pray over certain things, but then there's one thing that's just really gnawing at you. But for whatever reason, you don't pray about it. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe, maybe I'm awkward, right? Maybe I just am. My mom always used to say, Michael, you're unique, just like everybody else. But for those who trust in the Lord, who take all of their anxieties, who pour their hearts out to God, they cast all of them on God, that life is like the first rays of sunshine coming over the horizon at 5 o'clock on a hot summer morning. You know, it, it's like that light, that, it's, that light arises in the darkness for the upright. As Proverbs puts it in Proverbs 4 and verse 18, the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until f the full day. The path of the righteous might start off as just that little glimmer of light and, you know, the sun rises and it's casting its, its rays on everything until there's nothing that can hide from it. That's the, that's the type of righteousness, that's the type of light, the type of life that comes from fully trusting in God. Over in Lamentations 3 and verses 22 and 23, it says, The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Isn't that just fantastic? To sit there and think that God's compassions, not only do they never fail, not only does his loving kindness never fail, but it's renewed and it should be renewing us every single morning. 
You know, we go to bed and it's like, we don't even know if we're going to wake up the next morning. You know? And if we do wake up, we have no idea if we're going downstairs, down the hall or whatever, if, you know, the fridge is out, you know, and your food's been spoiling all night or the dishwasher just decided to flood the living room or kitchen or whatever the case may be. We don't know any of that stuff. But the one thing that we can always rely on is God's compassion, his kindness, his love, and it is new every morning. It is refreshing every day. It should refresh us every day. Isaiah 58 and verse 8, your light will break out like the dawn and your recovery will speedily spring forth and your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Modern vernacular, the Lord's got your back. You don't have to worry about looking behind you. In fact, over in Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62, the cost of discipleship area is that Jesus says, any man having set his hand to the plow and looking back is not for the kingdom of God. You don't have to worry about what's behind you. God's got your back. He is your rear guard. Your glory is just beginning when you trust in God. And trusting in God, it's not a, it's not a one-time deal either. It's a daily process. He, his compassion, his loving kindness is renewed every morning. We have to renew our faith every day. We have to renew our trust every day and build on ourselves. United to Christ and indwelt in the Spirit, that final radiance that we are to have when we leave this earthly world and we pass through the veil, it is wonderfully and graciously assured for the faithful. Those who cast their cares and their hopes entirely on God, on Christ, and the cross is guaranteed. And I feel confident in saying that because the Bible says that. But guaranteed, remaining faithful, receiving that crown, hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. Look, I know it wasn't easy for you, but you did well. I am well pleased. This is interesting. In the Bible, God never says he's proud. He didn't even say he was proud of Jesus. He says, I am well pleased. I actually think that sounds better, personally. Not only does the Bible speak, you know, pride goes before destruction, right? Arrogant spirit before the fall, but to hear a heavenly father say, you know what, I know it was hard. I know you had trials that other people didn't have, but I am so pleased with you remaining faithful. As you go through this week, you're going to have your own struggles. For some, they might be minor. For others, it might be a mountain. But ultimately, it's a reliance on God. The Bible speaks, and forgive me, please, because I do not remember the book chapter and verse. I believe it's Revelation, but I still couldn't give you the chapter and verse. Ask Brian afterwards. But is that one day is like a thousand years to God. You know, in the grand scheme of things, even if we live to be, you know, 110, 115, you know, I don't think we're going to get up there quite where Methuselah was, but... You know, but even if we do that, it is a blink compared to eternity. Focus on God this week when you're in your trials. Call up your brothers and sisters. If one is too busy, call another one. That's what we're here for. We are here to encourage, to edify, and to lift one another up. If you're here this evening... And you need the prayers of the congregation. And, and while I say that, let me, let me point something out. Because this morning, as well as next week, we're talking about Paul praying for the church. Don't let your prayers for the church just be on a Sunday when someone comes forward if they need to. Pray for the church daily. 
Pray for your brothers and sisters daily. You might not know what they're going through. Pray for them anyways. And I'll, t- I'll tell you a little secret that helps. Okay? Now, if you were in a thousand-member congregation, this really wouldn't work out, but we're not. Okay? And, I, and I'll, I'll tell you this, um, but one thing that actually helps get your mind focused on just that individual, right? Everybody pretty much sits in the same seats here, right? Take it afternoon, come up here, sit in the, it might sound silly to you, but sit in the chair where they sit and just pray specifically for them. Believe it or not, now I'm not putting faith in furniture, okay? I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to turn chairs whether they've got arms or not into idols, okay? But you will notice, I can guarantee it, you will notice a difference when you sit in that person's seat because you can't walk in their shoes. But when you sit in their seat and you pray for them, there is something that I can guarantee you that. If not, if, if you do that and you don't feel any different when you're praying, Barry will give you $20. <laughs> okay? I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm, I'm praying, but I'm not giving you 20 bucks. But if this evening you do need the prayers of the congregation in all seriousness, whatever those prayers might be, strength, encouragement, maybe you've just got something going on that, that's right now between you and God and you just want the prayers of the congregation, we'll be happy to do that with you. You can make that known publicly if you need by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.